Hello, everyone. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah, and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday, and then again every Thursday on YouTube, and you're not going to want to miss it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the heartbreaking case of Alexis Sharkey. This is one that really blew up in the media and was heavily requested by you guys for really the past year. And there have been some new developments in the case over the past couple months. So I thought it would be the perfect time to go ahead and cover this one. So with that all being said, let's jump right on into it today. Alexis Sharkey was born on January 25th, 1994 to her parents, Michael Robinault and Stacey Robinault. So her maiden name was Alexis Robinault. Alexis grew up in Northwestern Pennsylvania with both of her parents, as well as her two younger sisters. The Robinault family was and is a very tight-knit family. Alexis was really close to every single person in her family. They all loved spending time together. Together. And Alexis's parents really raised her to be the most warm, loving person that you could ever imagine. No one had a single bad thing to say about Alexis. She was described as the most inviting, caring person that you can imagine. She always wanted everyone to feel included. She never liked anyone to feel like they were the odd one out or that they didn't have any friends. She made everyone feel really special and everyone said that she was was the light that would walk into the room. Now, after high school, Alexis attended the University of Pittsburgh at Bradford, where she studied biology education. And if you're watching me on YouTube, you can tell that Alexis was a very beautiful girl. She's absolutely stunning, but along with her looks, she was also incredibly smart. So she had the beauty and the brains. Her family said that she had a very analytical mind and that she was obsessed with learning new things. She always wanted to grow her knowledge. Now, Alexis was in the National Honor Society in high school, and when she went to college and graduated from college in 2016, she actually graduated at the top of her class, and she wasn't planning on stopping there. Alexis was actually planning on going to medical school after college, but she did decide because she had dedicated so much of her life to her education and to her studies, she really wanted to take a step back and kind of experience life a little bit. She wanted to take some time for herself and she wanted to take a break before diving in to the stress that is medical school. So with that, Alexis decided that she was going to move and she was going to move to Texas. Now, Alexis had lived in Pennsylvania her entire life. She grew up there, went to middle school, high school, and college in Pennsylvania. And so a move to Texas was a very big thing for Alexis, and it really gave her the fresh start that she was looking for. Now, more specifically, Alexis moved to a town called Odessa, and she got a job working as a waitress at a Twin Peaks restaurant. And if you aren't familiar, Twin Peaks is kind of like a Hooters. It has the same aesthetic, the same vibe, except the girls aren't wearing, you know, the short orange shorts or the white shirts or whatever they wear at Hooters. They're wearing like denim shorts and this bra type of top. It's the same thing, essentially, just in a different way. Clearly, I don't know a lot about it. I've never been there. But that is where Alexis worked. So she got the job at the Twin Peaks restaurant and it really was a good thing for Alexis. She actually loved her job there. And not only was she able to, you know, get out of the house and have something to do and make some money, but she was also able to use Twin Peaks as kind of her social outlet because if you have ever moved to a town where you know no one, especially as an adult, it is very difficult to make friends. I can attest to this. I just moved to a town where I don't know anyone a couple months ago and making friends as an adult is hard. And Alexis really used Twin Peaks as, like I said, her social outlet. And she was able to make a lot of friends with her coworkers 
workers and the regulars that would come into the restaurant. And again, everyone loved Alexis. So she was really, really easy to get along with. Now, at the time that Alexis was working at the Twin Peaks restaurant and when she moved to Texas, Alexis was actually getting out of a relationship with her ex-fiance at the time. The relationship was not going well and her co-workers at Twin Peaks really helped Alexis get out of this situation. She leaned on them a bunch to kind of help support her through this new part of her life and through this breakup. And she ended up breaking off the engagement in 2017. Now, Alexis being a single girl did not last too long. She was very much wanted by a lot of different men. A lot of people were interested in her. And over time, Alexis's coworkers noticed that Alexis started getting along pretty well with one of the Twin Peaks regulars that would come into the restaurant. And that regular was a man named Tom Sharkey. Now, Tom was known to all of the Twin Peaks employees as a really charming and charismatic guy. He was constantly making everyone laugh and, like Alexis, was very friendly and inviting. And it was apparent to everyone that him and Alexis just clicked. Their personalities meshed really well together and they really enjoyed spending time with each other. Now, Tom Sharkey worked as a consultant in the oil industry, and his job also allowed him to travel around the world quite frequently, which was something that Alexis found very appealing because she also loved traveling. Now, there was quite of an age difference between Tom and Alexis. Alexis was in her early to mid-20s at this time, and Tom was actually in his mid-40s. So there's about a 20-year age gap there, but that age gap did not matter to them. Now, with Tom being in his mid-40s, he had already kind of been around the block when it came to marriage. He had been married once before, and he had two children from his previous marriage. So at the time that he met Alexis, he had two kids and an ex-wife, but Alexis also had an ex-fiance. And so they really just bonded over a lot of different things in life. And Alexis liked the fact that Tom seemed a lot more mature and well-established. He had this job and he was traveling. The picture of Tom Tom seemed perfect. So Alexis and Tom started dating and Alexis realized that she wanted to be able to travel with Tom during the times that he was traveling for his job. Like I said, she loved to travel. It was something they bonded over. But with her job at the Twin Peaks restaurant, it really didn't give her the flexibility that she wanted to travel and to be able to go to all of the places that he was going to. So she decided that she was going to quit her job at Twin Peaks and and when she did that, Alexis was not the type to just sit back and not have a job, not hustle, not do anything. So Alexis started working for a company called Monate. And if you are unaware, Monate is an MLM. And if you are unaware what an MLM is, let me explain that one as well. An MLM stands for a multi-level marketing business, and there's a bunch of different MLMs out there, but essentially they recruit independent contractors to sell their products, and then those independent contractors will also recruit other people to sell the product as well. A lot of people think that MLMs are pyramid schemes because essentially the only real way to make any real money in an MLM is by being at the top. And the way to be at the top is by recruiting people to be underneath you, as well as also sales. Getting people to purchase the product as well is also important. So purchasing the product, sales, as well as recruiting people to be underneath you and to also sell the product. So basically you're climbing your way to the top in an MLM. And a lot of people don't make money in MLMs. In fact, a lot of people end up losing money, but the idea of an MLM is really appealing to a lot of people because you can essentially do it from anywhere. You can work from home. A lot of it is based off of like Instagram and on social media. If you've ever gotten a DM from someone that's like, hey girl, you, you pretty much are, it's the same thing, you know? But regardless of all of that, Alexis decided to join the Monate team and start selling for them and join the MLM. And Alexis is actually one of the very few people that I have heard of. Obviously, it works for a decent amount of people because people still do this. But Alexis is one of the few people that I have heard of that have actually really succeeded in being in an MLM. 
she was actually able to make really, really good money doing this. And Monate, if you're unaware, I don't think I explained the company, Monate is a hair care business. They have a line of hair care products. So she would post about it all on her social media, all on her Instagram. And she really started to grow a following on her Instagram, which also helped with her business in selling these hair care products because she already had kind of the following to go with it. But something about Alexis is that she actually hated the word influencer. She did not like to be called an influencer. She felt like it was a little degrading and she liked being called a businesswoman because that is essentially what she was. She had her Instagram business and she had the Monate business, both that she was succeeding in. And on Alexis's Instagram, you can tell that she definitely portrays a life as we have seen in the past. We saw it with the Gabby Petito case. We've seen it in a lot of cases in the past where Alexis portrayed her life to be as perfect as possible. And just by looking at Alexis's Instagram, you know, she has all these highlights of her traveling to all these places. She seemed like a very, very happy person and that nothing was really going on behind closed doors. And Alexis's family has said that she was a very happy person. There wasn't like this persona that she was hiding. She was a happy person. That's who Alexis was to her core. And it's just incredibly sad and heartbreaking to see how her story ended because of that. Now, when it comes to podcasts that cover mystery and murder, Generation Y is a true original. If you're obsessed with crime and unsolved murder cases like me, this show has it all. Hosts Aaron and Justin cover cases from all angles. They break down theories, dive deep into forensic evidence, and discuss their opinions on the most perplexing cases. In a recent episode, Aaron and Justin look into the case of Lori DuPont. Lori was a well-respected 37-year-old nurse and a single mother. She met a physician named Mark Daniel at work, and the two hit it off and began a secret relationship. But after a while, the romance cooled, and Mark began harassing Lori at work. Turns out, Mark had a history of dating and being abusive towards nurses. Lori filed for a restraining order, but before the judge could issue it, Mark entered the hospital with a military sword and committed an unthinkable crime. Now, obviously, if you guys are here listening to me, then you love a good true crime podcast. You love a good murder mystery case. And this Generation Y podcast really has it all. I recommend it to all of my friends and I listen to it constantly. It's always on my playlist and I look forward to every new episode that comes out. They're so detail oriented and the cases that they choose really leave you on the edge of your seat. So listen to the Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Now, Valentine's Day is coming up and we know just the gift that you can give to that special someone for any and all special occasions. This Valentine's Day, it's time to give the man in your life a gift that 4 million men worldwide trust from Manscaped the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. You can use my exclusive offer by going to manscaped.com and use the code KILLER for 20% off and free shipping. The holidays went by so quickly, and if you didn't give him the gift he really wanted, make sure you get it right this time with the Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped. It's the gift every guy needs in their life to make each and every day just a little more special. Make sure his body also smells good with their signature scent, the Manscaped Refined Cologne, to complement his collection featuring a light citrus burst that settles with anchoring notes of vetiver and woodsy masculine finish. Manscaped created products that he's actually going to use after Valentine's Day. This is definitely something that you guys, I am going to be getting the man in my life and I'm really excited to see how it goes. So go to manscaped.com for our exclusive offer of 20% off plus free shipping with the code killer. Get 20% off and free shipping with code killer at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code killer. Gift his Cupid and arrow from Manscaped this Valentine's Day. In the era of one of the most heinous serial killers of all time, one murderous crew went curiously unnoticed. The McCrary's committed countless abductions, murders, robberies, and created general mayhem everywhere they went. Families Who Kill the Donut Shop Murders is a new true crime miniseries that follows a family who banded together to terrorize small town America, embarking on a brutal crime spree that captivated the nation. Led by the criminal duo of Sherman and his son-in-law, Carl, this disturbed family targeted people working night shifts in donut shops. In the Donut Shop Murders, you'll hear the details of their story for the first time from one of the McCrary's 
and the detective who tracked them across the country as they left death and destruction in their wake. Now, clearly, guys, if you are here listening to me, you love a good true crime story. And this one in particular has been my go-to. I've been listening to it every morning and I'm always on the edge of my seat every time I do. The detail that's been put into this mini series is really incredible. And I know you guys are going to love it as well. So you can follow Families Who Killed the Donut Shop Murders on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can binge all six episodes ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. I love my smile, but what I don't love is all the toxic ingredients in most dental care products. They're not good for my health or my teeth, and I want the best for my oral health. Products made with natural ingredients that help my smile and not harm it. That's why I use Lumino. Lumino makes toothpaste, mouthwash, and whitening products that actually help your oral health instead of hurting it. You won't find harsh bleaches, artificial dyes, or alcohol in any of Lumino's products. Everything they make is dentist formulated, backed by over 50 studies and proven to protect the good bacteria in your smile, also known as the microbiome. Now you guys, one of my new year's resolutions was to really pay more attention to what I'm putting into my body. And that goes all the way down to my dental care too. And I have been absolutely loving Lumino and it makes me feel really good that I know that the products that I'm putting into my body and the products that I'm using aren't harming me at all. They're natural. They make me feel healthier. And I really, really have seen a difference too, which is awesome. Now, I love how my smile feels and looks, and I know you'll love Lumino as much as I do too. So get 15% off your order today by going to luminohealth.com slash killer. That's L-U-M-I-N-E-U-X-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash killer to say 15%. Luminohealth.com slash killer. Now, something about being in an MLM is that like I said, you really can work from anywhere, but you also work a lot on your phone. So because Alexis had the Instagram business and the MLM, Alexis was always on her phone. She was always one of the first people to respond to text messages. She had her red receipts on. She was constantly on her phone all of the time. And that's going to come into play in a little later. So just remember that. So by the summer of 2019, Alexis and Tom had gotten engaged. And after their engagement, they decided to move from Texas. Texas to Colorado. It was a new place that they got to explore together and they were seemingly really happy. They explored a lot of different natural landmarks there and vlogged their experiences into short videos that they posted on YouTube. Now, Alexis and Tom actually ended up getting married in a courthouse in December of 2019. And then in early 2020, after their time in Colorado, they decided that while they loved it, they wanted to move back to Texas. And this time they wanted to move back to Houston, Texas. Now, once they moved back to Houston, this was a whole new area for Alexis. She had never been there before. And so she was kind of in that same situation where she wanted to make a good group of girlfriends. Because like I said earlier, she was able to use Twin Peaks, the restaurant that she waitressed at, as kind of her social outlet. But this time she wasn't working at somewhere where she could be social and meet new people. So she decided that she was going to download Bumble BFF. And if you've never heard of it, it's actually a really great app. I have used it myself and I really like it. Bumble BFF is kind of a section off of Bumble. It's like a branch off of Bumble when you download the Bumble dating app because that's what Bumble really is. It's a dating app. But Bumble has three different kind of sectors to it. They have Bumble Business, I think is what it is. And then they have Bumble Dating, which is the regular dating app. And then they have Bumble BFF, which was designed to help adults meet friends when they go to a new city or just if they live there their whole lives, whatever they wanted to do they can make friends on Bumble BFF. So Alexis downloaded the app and that is when she was able to be connected to a girl named Tanya. And her and Tanya got along really, really well. And Tanya introduced her to all of these other girls and they were able to form a really good girl group. And like I said, everyone loved Alexis. But one thing that they did notice about Alexis is that she was very quiet about her relationship. You know, when girls get together and they gossip about their relationship with their boyfriends or their husbands, or if they're single or whatever, Alexis didn't really talk a lot about 
Tom, and she didn't bring him around too much either. There was a couple times where Tom would come to the gatherings that the girls would bring their boyfriends to. Tom would tag along sometimes, and he did seem very nice to everyone. No one thought anything weird about it or that he was off in any way, but they did notice that Alexis didn't like to talk about her relationship a lot. Obviously, as we all know, once 2020 hit, the pandemic and quarantine started, and along with a lot of other people, Alexis used this time to really get into TikTok, the app TikTok. She created an account and started posting videos of herself, whether those were just funny dancing videos or whether they were skip videos, or she would also use it as well to sell her Monate products. She was able to use that as kind of a line of business as well. And sometimes Tom would make a cameo in these videos, but for the most part, it really was just Alexis. Now, something that I did think was an eerie foreshadow in her TikToks was she did make a TikTok. One of the audios in a TikTok, if you've heard it, it's, you know, my boyfriend's crazy, he kills people. That's what the audio is. And a lot of people have used that audio. And Alexis in particular also used that audio. And she put some sort of wording in the background of when some guy tries to come up to your window in your car and talk to you. And then you have the, my boyfriend's crazy, he kills people audio over it. And I just thought that that was incredibly eerie considering the circumstances. So now this all brings us to November of 2020, so a little bit over a year ago. Now, in the beginning of the month, Alexis went on a trip to Marfa, Texas with one of her girlfriends, and then after that, she went on a trip to Tulum, Mexico, also with her girlfriends. And Tom did not join her on either of these trips, but when Alexis got back home from her trips, she spoke to her mom on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Now, Alexis was not going back to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania to see her family for Thanksgiving. She was a very holiday-oriented person. She loved celebrating the holidays, but because of the pandemic, because of everything, she decided to stay in Texas with Tom, but her and her mom did plan on her going out to Pennsylvania for Christmas. So then we move on to the following day, which is Thanksgiving, November 26th, 2020, and Alexis woke up that day and texted back and forth with her mom for a little bit, wishing them a happy Thanksgiving and all of those things. And then she went over to Tanya's house for Thanksgiving dinner. Reminder, Tanya is the girl that she met on Bumble BFF. So she went over to Tanya's house for Thanksgiving. However, she didn't bring Tom. Now, it's not exactly clear why Tom did not show up with her to Thanksgiving dinner. It's not really understood why he didn't go. And a lot of people go one of two ways with this. A lot of people think it's really weird that he didn't go because you would typically want to spend Thanksgiving or the holidays with your partner. However, other people don't think that this is too big of a deal. But regardless, Alexis was not with Tom for the later half of the day for Thanksgiving. But what we do know happened is that after Thanksgiving dinner, Alexis actually got picked up by a friend from Tanya's house. And this friend took her to the bars and the two of them were drinking until about 3 a.m. And we will get into who picked her up and who she went out drinking to in a little bit. But just for now, just know that she did go out drinking until 3 a.m. And on her way back from drinking, she was being dropped back off at Tanya's house because she needed to pick up some of her belongings. So she texted Tanya around 3 a.m., letting her know that she was going to be coming back to her house. Now, with it being 3 a.m., Tanya was asleep at this point, so she did not see Alexis's text until the following morning. Now, the following day after Thanksgiving is Black Friday, and if you aren't familiar with what Black Friday is, it's a holiday here after Thanksgiving where there's always all of these giant sales. Everything goes on sale, and it's a really big deal for a lot of brands, for most brands, and for MLMs. And Alexis typically posted on social media constantly regardless of what day it was, but Black Friday would have been a day that she would have been all over. Because of the Monet business that she had and wanting to sell products, she would be trying to push this heavily. However, Alexis did not post 
anything that day. In fact, the only time anyone heard from Alexis on the day after Thanksgiving was around 5.30 p.m. when she texted her group chat with her and her girlfriends, this included Tanya, and asked anyone if they would want to go out drinking with her that night. However, because it was the day after Thanksgiving and a lot of people were either with their families or they were busy doing other things, no one could go out with Alexis that night. However, Tanya did propose that everyone went over to her house the next day for a movie night, kind of like a girl's night in, movie day type of deal. And everyone seemed really excited for it, including Alexis. She responded at around 6 p.m. into the group chat saying that she was really looking forward to it and couldn't wait. However, this would be the last time anyone would hear from Alexis again. Now, this is when things get a little bizarre. So a few hours after Alexis had talked in that group chat, Tom had actually reached out to one of Alexis's friends, boyfriends. Now, this guy was named John. So John was one of Alexis's friends' boyfriends, and Tom reached out to him to ask John if he had heard from Alexis, if he or his girlfriend had seen or heard from Alexis. And John was obviously taken a little bit aback by this. He didn't really understand why Tom was asking him and calling him about this. This was around 11 p.m. the day after Thanksgiving, and this was about a 45-minute conversation that Tom had with John, basically explaining to John that him and Alexis had gotten into an argument, and the argument resulted in Alexis running out the door of their apartment, getting into a black car, and driving away. Now, this is the first known phone call that Tom had with anyone in regards to Alexis. Alexis's disappearance. However, this would be only one of many stories that he told about how this night in particular unfolded. In one version of Tom's story, he said that Alexis left her phone at home when she left the house. However, he then changed that and said that she actually had her phone with her. He also said that he tried to track Alexis using the Find My Friends app and tried to track and follow the black car that she was in. And just for reference, Tom said that it wasn't her car. Alexis had someone pull up, got into the car with them, and drove away. But Tom said that he ultimately lost service when following this black car, so instead he decided to pull into a gas station where he sat in this gas station for two whole hours trying to figure out what his next move was going to be, and that is when he decided to start calling some of Alexis's friends, for example, John. So now we move on to the next day, which is November 28th. And in the morning, Tanya had texted the group chat saying that their movie day was still on and that she was really excited about it and how she had planned everything for it. And typically, Alexis would have been the first one to respond. Like I said earlier, she was constantly on her phone, constantly responding to texts. And Alexis was known to be one of, if not the first person to always respond in this group chat. However, Ever, when everyone started talking about this movie day that they had planned, Alexis never responded. Now, this is when Alexis's friends also noticed that she hadn't posted anything on social media in about 12 hours, which for a lot of people isn't a long time. However, like I said, Alexis was constantly on social media. If she wasn't posting about her business, she was posting about her day-to-day -day life and what she was doing. So it started to worry a lot of her friends when they noticed that she hadn't posted for a long time, but they thought that maybe Alexis just wasn't feeling it that day. So they were just kind of banking on her showing up to the movie night because she had said the day prior that she was all in for it. However, again, Alexis never showed up. Now, around 12.30 p.m., Tanya decided that she was just going to go over to Alexis and Tom's apartment and see for herself if Alexis was there. So she went over to the apartment, banged on the door a couple of times, but got absolutely no answer. And this is when Tanya decided to go ahead and call Stacy, which again is Alexis's mother, to tell Stacy what had been going on. And when Tanya called Stacy, she actually learned that Stacy had already been in contact with Tom about this. Tom had called Stacy and told her basically everything, told her that Alexis was missing, no one could find her. And she learned at that point that that entire day, Tom was basically calling people, telling them that he couldn't find Stacy and was kind of reaching out, asking 
asking if anyone had heard from her. Now, on the night of November 28th at around 9 p.m., after not hearing from Alexis for the entire day, pretty much a day and a half at that point, Alexis's friends decided to go ahead and file a missing persons report for her. But unfortunately, what no one in Alexis's life knew at this point was that Alexis's body had already been discovered when her missing persons report was filed. On the morning of November 28th, Alexis's body was found by city workers on the side of the road on Red Haw Lane in Houston, Texas, which was about three miles away from the apartment that she lived in with Tom. Her body was found without any clothes on, and she was described as very clean, almost as if she had just bathed or gotten out of the shower. And the first worker that saw her actually thought that she was a mannequin by the way her body was laid out. But after driving by her, he said he had this weird instinctual feeling that something could be wrong. So he went ahead and called his supervisor and his supervisor drove over to the spot and realized that it was in fact human remains that they had found. Now, again, at the time, there was no missing persons report filed for Alexis. However, once it was filed later that night, police brought Tom in to identify the body, and he was able to identify that the body found was his wife, Alexis Sharkey. Now, when Alexis's body was discovered, there were no visible sign of any injuries. There was no blood, there were no marks, none of it. So no one really knew what to go off of here as far as what happened. However, over time, more and more information about Alexis's life started coming out, and more particularly, her life with Tom. Now, according to Alexis's friends, Alexis was planning on divorcing Tom. She had told some of her close friends this. Like I said earlier, she wasn't super big on talking about her relationship, but she did disclose and confide in some of her closest friends that she was planning on divorcing him. And while she was on vacation in Marfa, Texas, right before she went to Tulum, she did confide in one of her girlfriends and said that she was scared for her life when she was around Tom. Other friends of Alexis knew that the two of them had already split their bank accounts and that the papers had been written up for the divorce. And the only thing that needed to happen at that point was that they needed to be signed. And while all of this information was coming up, new information came up as well about her trip to Tulum. Again, after going to Marfa, Texas, she went to Tulum with some of her girlfriends. And it came out that on this trip to Tulum, Alexis met a guy. On this trip. This guy was named Sebastian and he was a DJ that was based out of Houston actually. So the two of them met in Tulum and apparently really hit it off and there is a lot of he said she said about what exactly happened on that trip and honestly it really it does not matter. Some of her friends say they did hook up, some say that they didn't, but again the, in the grand scheme of things it really just doesn't matter. But what we do know is that on Thanksgiving night when Alexis went out until 3 a.m. the friend that picked her up to go to the bar and the friend that she went to the bars with until 3 a.m. was, in fact, Sebastian. Now, when it comes to Tom, in the beginning of the investigation, the police said that he was actually very cooperative. He didn't do any media interviews except for one over-the-phone interview with a reporter who claimed that a lot of Tom's answers felt disjointed and that Tom didn't really seem to have his story straight. Along with that, the reporter said that Tom claimed that Alexis had a very different persona online than she did with him. Tom said that Alexis was a very upbeat, light, bright, positive, happy person online. However, with him, he said that she was very dark and depressed and had all of these. And Tom said that he spent a lot of time building up her self-esteem. And in this over-the-phone interview, along with just over the entirety of the investigation, like I said earlier, Tom did change his story multiple times. At first, he said they did did get into an argument, then he said they didn't, and then he claimed that she got into a black car, and then he switched that up and said that she just left on foot, which didn't really make a lot of sense because it was raining in Houston that night, and so Alexis more than likely would not have just left on foot. Now, one thing that Alexis's family has really been adamant about, especially when this interview came out with Tom, they said that the whole idea that Alexis was this person who Tom had to build up was entirely untrue. Like I said earlier, Alexis 
is described by every single person. And trust me, there are a lot of interviews out there, um, a lot of statements out there just from her family and her friends, the people that knew her best as the most upbeat light of a human that you could get. And I'm sure she had her days, everyone does. But as far as an overall persona, her family said that that's completely inaccurate what Tom is saying. Now, when police were going on with their investigation, obviously they looked at Tom in this case, because as we've seen in any case that we've ever covered, you always look at the person closest to the victim, which in this case was Tom. So they had their eye on Tom from the beginning, but something that was really setting this case back in the very beginning was the fact that there was no cause of death determined. It actually took two months for a cause of death to be determined. And on January 19th, 2021, which is almost exactly a year ago today, the cause of death for Alexis Sharkey was released and it was revealed that she died of strangulation and that her death was a homicide. Now, once the cause of death was ruled a homicide, it really ruled out any possibility of, you know, did she overdose? Did she slip and hit her head? All of these kind of sideline questions that were going on in terms of how she died and if it was an accident or if it wasn't, which most people from the beginning, especially her family and close friends, believed that this was not an accident, but this really secured that. Now, Tom was listed as Alexis's next of kin in this case, which meant that he basically had the rights to claim her body and do whatever he wanted with it. However, Tom and Stacy did speak on the phone after Alexis's body was discovered, and they both agreed that Alexis would be flown back to Pennsylvania where her family could bury her body there. Her family wanted to do a proper funeral and a burial and just bring her home, and Tom did agree to this at first. However, when it came down to it, and right before all of that was about to happen, Tom basically went completely MIA. He went completely radio silent, wasn't responding to Stacy at all, did not talk to her, and went completely silent for two whole weeks. So for two whole weeks, Alexis's family had no idea what was going on. They had no idea what Tom had done to Alexis with her body and why he wasn't responding. It was all very weird. And it got to the point where it wasn't even that Tom came back and was like, oh, sorry, I'm here now. Let's send her body back to Pennsylvania to have a proper burial. The medical examiner actually changed it. So Alexis's family was put on the next of kin in the documents. And that was the only way that they were able to get her back to Pennsylvania that point because Tom went completely off the grid. So fortunately, but also obviously unfortunately, Alexis's family was able to fly Alexis home and have a proper funeral and bury her there. Now, over the past year, a lot has happened in this case and a lot of new information has surfaced. Now, what we know now is that in the first two weeks of this investigation, Tom had actually left Texas without telling police. So he basically fled the state. Now, when he did this, authorities tried to reach out to him multiple times, but he didn't really give a good answer as to why he fled. He just kind of had all of these excuses. And then in August 2021, authorities contacted Tom again to try and get his DNA. And they were really just trying to get to the bottom of his ever-changing story. So police got in contact with him and Tom told police that he was in Georgia. So if they wanted to come get his DNA, they would have to go to Georgia. So what did police do? They went to Georgia. Police went out to Georgia. However, once they arrived, they learned very quickly once they got to the address that Tom gave them that Tom no longer lived in Georgia. What we know is that he did live in Georgia at some point because that's actually where he fled to first when he left Texas. So he was in Georgia for a decent period of time. However, once authorities went to go get his DNA, that is when he fled again. Now at this point, authorities knew that the only person based off of their entire investigation that would have the means and motive to harm Alexis and to murder her would be Tom. The motive being that Tom could have learned about Sebastian. The motive being that Tom could have been upset about the divorce. Tom was a very big guy. He was like a bodybuilder type of guy. So he could have easily hurt Alexis if he wanted to. Now, after the whole Georgia debacle, police put out an arrest warrant for 
Tom, and they learned shortly after that Tom had actually fled to Fort Myers, Florida, because that is where his daughter lived. So he was in Fort Myers, Florida, and because of the publicity that this case had gotten, police really tried to keep the arrest warrant under wraps because they didn't want Tom to flee again. They kind of had him right where they wanted him at that point, and they knew where he was and they were afraid that if he found out that police knew where he was, that he would up and run again. Now on October 6th of 2021, the US Marshal arrived to Tom's daughter's home and started banging on the door and they announced themselves at the door. And before anyone could get through the door, Tom ran upstairs to the second story of his daughter's home, took a gun and committed suicide. Now, like I said earlier, police determined over the course of the past year that Tom would have been the only one to have the motive and access to Alexis to murder her. The fact that he was constantly changing his story, there was an argument, there wasn't an argument. She had her phone, she didn't have her phone, she left in a car, she left on foot. Everything was constantly changing and it was very clear to most people at that point that Tom was the one who murdered Alexis. Now, what's unfortunate and upsetting and frustrating and infuriating, honestly, is that Tom took his life before Alexis's family and friends could have the answers as to what exactly happened that night that led to this catastrophe and this devastation of Alexis losing her life. Because now we'll really never know what happened because Tom took his own life. But with that being said, I'm very curious to hear what y'all have to say about this case. And that, you guys, is the case of Alexis Sharkey. I hope you guys enjoyed today's case. That is going to be all for me today. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here every Wednesday on the podcast and every Thursday on YouTube and you're not going to want to miss it. And I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Thank you guys so much for watching today's episode. Make sure you join us next week where we uncover the Slender Man case. This is a horrific case. It's very upsetting. It's very gruesome. And I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. So I will see you there.